This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bleak House by Charles Dickens, Chapter 19 Moving On It is the long vacation in the regions of Chancery Lane. The good ships, law and equity, those teak-built, copper-bottomed, iron-fastened, brazen-faced, and not by any means fast-sailing clippers, are laid up in ordinary. The flying Dutchman, with a crew of ghostly clients imploring all whom they may encounter to peruse their papers, has drifted, for the time being, heaven knows where. The courts are all shut up. The public offices lie in a hot sleep. Westminster Hall itself is a shady solitude where nightingales might sing, and a tenderer class of suitors than is usually found there walk. The Temple, Chancery Lane, Sergeant's Inn, and Lincoln's Inn even unto the fields, are like tidal harbours at low water, where stranded proceedings, offices at anchor, idle clerks lounging on top-sided stools that will not recover their perpendicular until the current of term sets in, lie high and dry upon the ooze of the long vacation. Outer doors of chambers are shut up by the score. Messages and parcels are to be left at the porter's lodge by the bushel. A crop of grass would grow in the chinks of the stone pavement outside Lincoln's Inn Hall but that the ticket-porters, who have nothing to do beyond sitting in the shade there, with their white aprons over their heads to keep the flies off, grub it up and eat it thoughtfully. There is only one judge in town. Even he only comes twice a week to sit in chambers. If the country folks of those assize towns on his circuit could see him now, no full-bottom wig, no red petticoats, no fur, no javelin men, no white wands, merely a close-shaven gentleman in white trousers and a white hat, with sea-bronze on the judicial countenance, and a strip of bark peeled by the solar rays from the judicial nose, who calls in at the shellfish shop as he comes along, and drinks iced ginger-beer. The bar of England is scattered over the face of the earth. How England can get on through four long summer months without its bar, which is its acknowledged refuge in adversity and its only legitimate triumph in prosperity, is beside the question. Assuredly that shield and buckler of Britannia are not in present wear. The learned gentleman, who is always so tremendously indignant at the unprecedented outrage committed on the feelings of his client by the opposite party, that he never seems likely to recover it, is doing infinitely better than might be expected in Switzerland. The learned gentleman, who does the withering business, and who blights all opponents with his gloomy sarcasm, is as merry as a grig at a French watering-place. The learned gentleman, who weeps by the pint on the smallest provocation, has not shed a tear these six weeks. The very learned gentleman, who has cooled the natural heat of his gingery complexion in pools and fountains of law, until he has become great in knotty arguments for term time, when he poses the drowsy bench with legal chaff, inexplicable to the uninitiate, uninitiated, and to most of the initiated, too, is roaming with a characteristic delight in aridity and dust about Constantinople. Other dispersed fragments of the same great palladium are to be found on the canals of Venice, at the second cataract of the Nile, in the baths of Germany, and sprinkled on the sea sand all over the English coast. Scarcely one is to be encountered in the deserted region of Chancery Lane. 
if such a lonely member of the bar do flit across the waste and come upon a prowling suitor who is unable to leave off haunting the scenes of his anxiety they frighten one another and retreat into opposite shades it is the hottest long vacation known for many years all the young clerks are madly in love and according to their various degrees pine for bliss with a beloved object at margate ramsgate or gravesend all the middle-aged clerks think their families too large all the unowned dogs who stray into the inns of court and pant about staircases and other dry places seeking water give short howls of aggravation all the blind men's dogs in the streets draw their masters against pumps or trip them over buckets a shop with a sun-blind and a watered pavement and a bowl of gold and silver fish in the window is a sanctuary temple bar gets so hot that it is to the adjacent strand and fleet street what a heater is in an urn and keeps them simmering all night there are offices about the inns of court in which a man might be cool if any coolness were worth purchasing at such a price in dullness but the little thoroughfares immediately outside those retirements seem to blaze in mr crook's court it is so hot that the people turn their houses inside out and sit in chairs upon the pavement mr crook included who there pursues his studies with his cat who never is too hot by his side the sol's arms has discontinued the harmonic meetings for the season and little swills is engaged at the pastoral gardens down the river where he comes out in quite an innocent manner and sings comic ditties of a juvenile complexion calculated as the bill says not to wound the feelings of the most fastidious mind over all the legal neighborhood there hangs like some great veil of rust or gigantic cobweb the idleness and pensiveness of the long vacation mr snagsby law stationer of cook's court cursitor street is sensible of the influence not only in his mind as a sympathetic and contemplative man but also in his business as a law stationer aforesaid he has more leisure for musing in staple inn and in the rolls yard during the long vacation than at other seasons and he says to the two prentices what a thing it is in such hot weather to think that you live in an island with the sea a-rolling and a-bowling right round you guster is busy in the little drawing-room on this pleasant afternoon in the long vacation when mr and mrs snagsby have it in contemplation to receive company the expected guests are rather select than numerous being mr and mrs chadband and no more from mr chadband's being much given to describe himself both verbally and in writing as a vessel he is occasionally mistaken by strangers for a gentleman connected with navigation but he is as he expresses it in the ministry mr chadband is attached to no particular denomination and is considered by his persecutors to have nothing so very remarkable to say on the greatest of subjects as to render his volunteering on his own account at all incumbent on his conscience but he has his followers and mrs snagsby is of the number mrs snagsby has but recently taken a passage upward by the vessel chadband and her attention was attracted to the bark a one when she was something flushed by the hot weather my little woman says mr snagsby to the sparrows in staple inn likes to have her religion rather sharp you see so guster much impressed by regarding herself for the time as the handmaid of chadband whom she knows to be endowed with the gift of holding forth for four hours at a stretch prepares the little drawing-room for tea 
All the furniture is shaken and dusted. The portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Snagby are touched up with a wet cloth. The best tea service is set forth, and there is excellent provision made of dainty new bread, crusty twists, cool fresh butter, thin slices of ham, tongue, and German sausage, and delicate little rows of anchovies nestling in parsley, not to mention new-laid eggs to be brought up warm in a napkin and hot buttered toast. For Chadband is rather a consuming vessel. The persecutors say a gorging vessel, and can wield such weapons of the flesh as a knife and fork remarkably well. Mr. Snagsby, in his best coat, looking at all the preparations when they are completed, and coughing his cough of deference behind his hand, says to Mrs. Snagsby, "'At what time did you expect Mr. and Mrs. Chadband, my love?' "'At six says Mrs. Snagsby. Mr. Snagsby observes in a mild and casual way that it's gone that. Perhaps you'd like to begin without them, is Mrs. Snagsby's reproachful remark. Mr. Snagsby does look as if he would like it very much, but he says with his cough of mildness, No, my dear, no, I merely named the time. "'What time?' says Mrs. Snagsby. "'To eternity.' "'Very true, my dear,' said Mr. Snagsby. "'Only when a person lays in victuals for tea, "'a person does it with a view, perhaps, more to time. "'And when a time is named for having tea, "'it's better to come up to it.' "'To come up to it,' Mrs. Snagsby repeats with severity. "'Up to it, as if Mr. Chadband was a fighter.' "'Not at all, my dear,' says Mr. Snagsby. "'Here, Guster, who has been looking out of the bedroom window, "'comes rustling and scratching down the little staircase like a popular ghost, "'and falling flushed into the drawing-room, "'announces that Mr. and Mrs. Chadband have appeared in the court. "'The bell at the inner door in the passage immediately thereafter tinkling. "'She is admonished by Mrs. Snagsby on pain of instant instant reconsignment to her patron saint not to omit the ceremony of announcement much discomposed in her nerves which were previously in the best order by this threat she so fearfully mutilate, mutilates that point of state as to announce mr and mrs cheeseming least which a mentor say what's her name and retires conscience stricken from the presence. Mr. Chadband is a large yellow man, with a fat smile, and a general appearance of having a good deal of train oil in his system. Mrs. Chadband is a stern, severe-looking, silent woman. Mr. Chadband moves softly and cumbrously, not unlike a bear who has been taught to walk upright. He is very much embarrassed about the arms as if they were inconvenient to him, and he wanted to grovel, is very much in a perspiration about the head, and never speaks without first putting up his great hand, as delivering a token to his hearers that he is going to edify them. "'My friends,' said Mr. Chadband, "'peace be on this house, on the master thereof, on the mistress thereof, on the young maidens, and on the young men. My friends, why do I wish for peace? What is peace? Is it war? No. Is it strife? No. It is lovely and gentle and beautiful and pleasant and serene and joyful. Oh, yes. Therefore, my friends, I wish for peace upon you and upon yours. In consequence of Mrs. Snagsby looking deeply edified, Mr. Snagsby thinks it's expedient on the whole to say amen, which is well received. Now, my friends, proceeds Mr. Chadband, since I am upon this theme, Guster presents herself. Mrs. Snagsby, in a spectral bass voice, and without removing her eyes from Chadband, says with dread distinctness, Go away. 
Now, my friends, said Chadband, since I am upon this theme, and in my lowly path improving it, Guster is heard unaccountably to murmur, one thousand seven hundred and eighty-two. The spectral voices repeats more solemnly, Go away. Now, my friends, says Mr. Chadband, we will inquire in a spirit of love. Still, Guster reiterates, one thousand seven hundred and eighty-two. Mr. Chadband, pausing with the resignation of a man accustomed to be persecuted, and languidly folding up his chin into his fat smile, says, Let us hear the maiden. Speak, maiden. One thousand seven hundred and eighty-two, if you please, sir. Which he wished to know what the shilling were for, says Guster, breathless. For, returns Mrs. Chadband, for his fare. Guster replied that he insists on one and eight pence, or on summonsizing the party. Mrs. Snagsby and Mrs. Chadband are proceeding to grow shrill in indignation when Mr. Chadband quiets, quiets the tumult by lifting up his hand. My friends, says he, I remember a duty unfulfilled yesterday. It is right that I should be chastened in some penalty. I ought not to murmur. Rachel, pay the eightpence. While Mrs. Snagsby, drawing her breath, looks hard at Mr. Snagsby, as who should say, You hear this apostle. And while Mr. Chadband glows with humility and train oil, Mrs. Chadband pays the money. It is Mr. Chadband's habit it is the head and front of his pretensions indeed to keep this sort of debtor and creditor account in the smallest items and to post it publicly on the most trivial occasions my friends says chadband eight pence is not much it might justly have been one and fourpence it might justly have been half a crown oh let us be joyful joyful oh let us be joyful with which remark, which appears from its sound to be an extract in verse, Mr. Chadband stalks to the table, and before taking a chair, lifts up his admonitory hand. My friends, says he, what is this which we now behold as being spread before us? Refreshment. Do we need refreshment then, my friends? We do. And why do we need refreshment, my friends? because we are but mortal, because we are but sinful, because we are but of the earth, because we are not of the air. Can we fly, my friends? We cannot. Why can we not fly, my friends? Mr. Snagsby, presuming on the success of his last point, ventures to observe in a cheerful and rather knowing tone, no wings, but is immediately frowned down by Mrs. Snagsby. I say, my friends, pursues Mr. Chadband, utterly rejecting and obliterating Mr. Snagsby's suggestion, why can we not fly? Is it because we are calculated to walk? It is. Could we walk, my friends, without strength? We could not. What should we do without strength, my friends? Our legs would refuse to bear us, our knees would double up, our ankles would turn over, and we should come to the ground. Then, from whence, my friends, in a human point of view, do we derive the strength that is necessary to our limbs? Is it, says Chadband, glancing over the table, from bread in various forms, from butter which is churned, from the milk which is yielded unto us by the cow, from the eggs which are laid by the fowl, from ham, from tongue, from sausage, and from such like? It is. Then let us partake of the good things which are set before us. The persecutors denied that their was any particular gift in Mr. Chadband's piling verbose flights of stairs, one upon another, after this fashion. But this can only be received as proof of their determination to persecute, since it must be within everybody's experience 
that the Chad Band style of oratory is widely received and much admired. Mr. Chadband, however, having concluded for the present, sits down at Mr. Snagsby's table and lays about him prodigiously. The conversion of nutriment of any sort into oil of the quality already mentioned appears to be a process so inseparable from the constitution of this exemplary vessel that in beginning to eat and drink he may be described as always becoming a kind of considerable oil mills or other large factory for the production of that article on a wholesale scale on the present evening of the long vacation in cook's court cursitor street he does such a powerful stroke of business that the warehouse appears to be quite full when the works cease at this period of the entertainment guster who has never recovered her first failure but has neglected no possible or impossible means of bringing the establishment and herself into contempt among which may be briefly enumerated her unexpectedly performing clashing military music on mr chadband's head with plates and afterwards crowning that gentleman with muffins at which period of the entertainment guster whispers mr snagsby that he is wanted and being wanted in the not to put too fine a point upon it in the shop says mr snagsby rising perhaps this good company will excuse me for half a minute Mr. Snagsby descends and finds the two prentices intently contempla contemplating a police constable who holds a ragged boy by the arm. "'Why, bless my heart,' says Mr. Snagsby, "'what's the matter?' "'This boy,' says the constable, although he's repeatedly told to, won't move on. "'I'm always a moving on, sir,' cries the boy, wiping away his grimy tears with his arm. I've always been a-movin' and a-movin' on ever since I was born. Where can I possibly move to, sir, more, nor I do move? He won't move on, says the constable calmly, with a slight professional hitch on his neck, involving its better settlement in his stiff stock, although he has been repeatedly cautioned, and therefore I am obliged to take him into custody. He's as obstinate a young gunoff as i know he won't move on oh my eye where can i move to cries the boy clutching quite desperately at his hair and beating his bare feet upon the floor of mr snagsby's passage don't you come none of that or i shall make blessed short work of you says the constable giving him a passionate shake my instructions are that you are to move on. I have told you so five hundred times. But where? cries the boy. Well, really, constable, you know, says Mr. Stagsby wistfully, and coughing behind his hand his cough of great perplexity and doubt. Really, that does seem a question. Where, you know? My instructions don't go to that, replies the constable. My instructions are that this boy is to move on. Do you hear, Joe? It is nothing to you or to anyone else that the great lights of the parliamentary sky have failed for some few years in this business to set you the example of moving on. The one grand recipe remains for you, the profound philosophical prescription, the be-all and the end-all of your strange existence upon earth. Move on. You are no means to move off, Joe for the great lights can't at all agree about that. Move on. Mr. Snagsby says nothing to this effect, says nothing at all, indeed, but coughs his forlornest cough, expressive of no thoroughfare in any direction. By this time Mr. and Mrs. Chadband and Mrs. Snagsby, hearing the altercation, have appeared upon the stairs. Guster, having never left the end of the passage, the whole household are assembled. The simple question is, sir, says the constable, whether you know this boy. He says you do. Mrs. Snagsby, from her elevation, instantly cries out, No, he don't. 
"'My little woman,' says Mr. Snagsby, looking up the staircase. "'My love, permit me. Pray have a moment's patience, my dear. I do know something of this lad, and in what I know of him I can't say that there's any harm, perhaps on the contrary, constable, to whom the law stationer relates his joeful and woeful experience, suppressing the half-crown fact.' well says the constable so far it seems he had grounds for what he said when i took him into custody up in holborn he said you knew him upon that a young man who was in the crowd said he was acquainted with you and you were, were a respectable housekeeper and if i'd call and make the inquiry he'd appear the young man don't seem inclined to keep his word but oh here is the young man enter mr guppy who nods to Mr. Snagsby and touches his hat with a chivalry of clerkship to the ladies on the stairs. I was strolling away from the office just now when I found this row going on, says Mr. Guppy to the law stationer, and as your name was mentioned, I thought it was right the thing should be looked into. It was very good-natured of you, sir, said Mr. Snagsby, and I am obliged to you and Mr. Snagsby again relates his experience, again suppressing the half-crown fact. "'Now I know where you live,' says the constable, then, to Joe. "'You live down in Tom all alones. That's a nice innocent place to live in, ain't it?' "'I can't go and live in no nicer place, sir,' replies Joe. "'They wouldn't have no think to say to me if I was to go to a nice innocent place for to live.' who would go and let a nice innocent lodging to such a regular one as me you are very poor ain't you says the constable yes i am indeed sir very poor in general replies joe i leave you to judge now i shook these two half-crowns out of him says the constable producing them to the company in only putting my hand upon him there what's left mr snagsby says joe out of a sovereign as was give me by a lady in a whale as said she was a servant and as come to my crossing one night and asked to be showed this ere ouse and the house what im as you give the writing to died at and the burying ground what he's buried in she says to me she says are you the boy at the inkwitch she says I says, yes, I says. She says to me, she says, can you show me all them places? I says, yes, I can, I says. And she says to me, do it. And I done it, and she give me a sovereign and hooked it. And I ain't had much of the sovereign neither, says Joe with dirty tears, for I had to pay five bob down in Tom's all alones, afford they squared for to give me change, and then a young man he thieved another five while I was asleep, and another boy he thieved nine pence, and the landlord he stood drains round with a lot more on it. You don't expect anybody to believe this about the lady and the sovereign, do you? says the constable, eyeing him aside with ineffable disdain. "'I don't know as I do, sir,' replies Joe. "'I don't expect nothing at all, sir, much, "'but that's the truth history on it.' "'You see what he is,' the constable observes to the audience. "'Well, Mr. Snagsby, if I don't lock him up this time, "'will you engage for his moving on?' "'No,' cries Mrs. Snagsby from the stairs. "'My little woman,' pleads her husband. "'Constable, I have to... D no doubt he'll move on. You know you really must do it, says Mr. Snagsby. I'm every ways agreeable, sir, says the hapless Joe. Do it, then, observes the constable. You know what you have got to do. Do it, and recollect you won't get off so easy next time. Catch hold of your money. Now, the sooner you're five mile off, the better for all parties. With this farewell hint, and pointing generally to the setting sun as a likely place to move on to, the constable bids his auditors good afternoon, and makes the echoes of Cook's Court perform slow music for him as he walks away on the shady side, 
carrying his iron-bound hat in his hand for a little ventilation. Now, Joe's improbable story concerning the lady and the sovereign has awakened more or less the curiosity of all the company. Mr. Guppy, who has an inquiring mind in matters of evidence, and who has been suffering severely from the lassitude of the long vacation, takes that interest in the case, that he enters on a regular cross-examination of the witness, which is found so interesting by the ladies that Mrs. Snagsby politely invites him to step upstairs and drink a cup of tea, if he will excuse the disarranged state of the tea-table, consequent on their previous exertions. Mr. Guppy, yielding his assent to this proposal, Joe is requested to follow into the drawing-room doorway, where Mr. Guppy takes him in hand as a witness, patting him into this shape, that shape, and the other shape, like a butter-man dealing with so much butter, and worrying him according to the best models. Nor is the examination unlike many such model displays, both in respect to its eliciting nothing, and of its being lengthy, for Mr. Guppy is sensible of his talent, and Mrs. Snagsby feels, not only that it gratifies her inquisitive disposition, but that it lifts her husband's establishment higher up in the law. During the progress of this keen encounter, the vessel Chad Band, being merely engaged in the oil trade, gets aground, and waits to be floated off. Well, says Mr. Guppy, either this boy sticks to it like cobbler's wax, or there is something out of the common here that beats anything that ever came into my way at Kenji and Carboy's. Mrs. Chadband whispers Mrs. Snagsby, who exclaims, You don't say so. For years, replies Mrs. Chadband has known Kenji and Carboy's office for years, Mrs. Snagsby triumphantly explains to Mr. Guppy, Mrs. Chadband, this gentleman's wife, Reverend Mr. Chadband. Oh, indeed, says Mr. Guppy. Before I married my present husband, says Mrs. Chadband. Was you a party in anything, ma'am? says Mr. Guppy, transferring his cross-examination. No. "'Not a party to anything, ma'am?' says Mr. Guppy. Mrs. Chadband shakes her head. "'Perhaps you were acquainted with somebody who was a party in something, ma'am,' says Mr. Guppy, who likes nothing better than to model his conversation on forensic principles. "'Not exactly that either,' replies Mrs. Chadband, humouring the joke with a hard-favoured smile. "'Not exactly that either.' either, repeats Mr. Guppy. Very good. Pray, ma'am, was it a lady of your acquaintance who had some transactions? We will not at present say what transactions. With Kenji and Carboy's office, or was it a gentleman of your acquaintance? Take time, ma'am. We shall come to it presently. Man or woman, ma'am? Neither, says Mrs. Chadband, as before. "'Oh, a child,' says Mr. Guppy, throwing on the admiring Mrs. Snagsby the regular acute professional eye which is thrown on British jurymen. "'Now, ma'am, perhaps you'll have the kindness to tell us what child?' "'You have got it at last, sir,' says Mrs. Chadband, with another hard-favoured smile. "'Well, sir, it was before your time, most likely, judging from your appearance.' I was left in charge of a child named Esther Summerson, who was put out in life by Messrs. Kenji and Carboy. "'Miss Summerson, ma'am?' cries Mr. Guppy, excited. "'I call her Esther Summerson,' says Mrs. Chadband, with austerity. "'There was no missing of the girl in my time. It was Esther.' Esther do this, Esther do that, and she was made to do it. My dear ma'am, returns Mr. Guppy, moving across the small apartment, the humble individual who now addresses you received that young lady in London when she first came here from the establishment to which you have alluded. Allow me to have the pleasure of taking you by the hand. 
Mr. Chadband, at last seeing his opportunity, makes his accustomed signal and rises with a smoking head, which he dabs with his pocket handkerchief. Mrs. Snasby whispers, Hush! My friends, says Chadband, we have partaken in moderation, which was certainly not the case so far as he was concerned, of the comforts which have been provided for us. May this house live upon the fatness of the land, may corn and wine be plentiful therein, may it grow, may it thrive, may it prosper, may it advance, may it proceed, may it press forward. But, my friends, we have partaken... Have we partaken of anything else? We have. My friends, of what else have we partaken? Of spiritual profit? Yes. From whence have we derived that spiritual profit? My young friend, stand forth. Joe, thus apostrophized, gives a slouch backward, and another slouch forward, and another slouch to each side, and confronts the eloquent Chadband with evident doubts of his intentions. My young friend, says Chadband, you are to us a pearl, you are to us a diamond, you are to us a gem, you are to us a jewel, and why, my young friend? I don't know, replies Joe, I don't know nothing. My young friend, says Chadman, it is because you know nothing that you are a, to us a gem and a jewel. For what you are, my young friend, are you a beast of the field? No. A bird of the air? No. A fish of the sea or river? No. You are a human boy, my young friend, a human boy. Oh, glorious to be a human boy. And why glorious, my young friend? Because you are capable of receiving the lessons of wisdom because you are capable of profiting by this discourse which I now deliver for your good, because you are not a stick or a staff or a stock or a stone or a post or a pillar. O oh, running stream of sparkling joy, to be a soaring human boy! And do you cool yourself in that stream now, my young friend? No. Why do you not cool yourself in that stream now? because you are in a state of darkness, because you are in a state of obscurity, because you are in a state of sinfulness, because you are in a state of bondage. My young friend, what is bondage? Let us, in a spirit of love, inquire. At this threatening stage of the discourse, Joe, who seems to have been gradually going out of his mind, smears his right arm over his face and gives a terrible yawn. Mrs. Snagsby indignantly expresses her belief that he is a limb of the arch-fiend. "'My friends,' says Mr. Chadband, with his persecuted chin folding itself into its fat smile again as he looks round, "'it is right that I should be humbled. It is right that I should be tried. It is right that I should be mortified. It is right that I should be corrected. I stumbled on Sabbath last when I thought with pride of my three hours improving. The account is now favorably balanced. My creditor has accepted a composition. Oh, let us be joyful! Joyful! Oh, let us be joyful! Great sensation on the part of Mrs. Snagsby. My friends, says Chadband, looking round him in conclusion, I will not proceed with my young friend now. Will you come to-morrow, my young friend, and inquire of this good lady, where I am to be found to deliver a discourse unto you? And will you come like the thirsty swallow upon the next day, and upon the day after that, and upon the day after that, and upon many pleasant days, to hear discourses? This with a cow-like lightness." Joe, whose immediate object seems to be to get away on any terms, gives a shuffling nod. Mr. Guppy then throws him a penny, and Mrs. Snagsby calls to Guster to see him safely out of the house. But before he goes downstairs, Mr. Snagsby loads him with some broken meats from the table, which he carries away, hugging in his arms. So, Mr. Chadband, of whom the persecutors say that it is no wonder he should go on for any length of time uttering such abominable nonsense, but that the wonder rather is that he should ever leave off, having once the audacity to begin, 
retires into private life until he invests a little capital of supper in the oil trade. Joe moves on, through the long vacation, down to Blackfriars Bridge, where he finds a baking stony corner wherein to settle to his repast. And there he sits munching and gnawing and looking up at the great cross on the summit of St. Paul's Cathedral, glittering above a red and violet-tinted cloud of smoke. From the boy's face one might suppose that sacred emblem to be, in his eyes, the crowning confusion of the great confused city, so golden, so high up, so far out of his reach. There he sits, the sun going down, the river running fast, the crowd flowing by him in two streams, everything moving on to some purpose and to one end, until he is stirred up and told to move on too. End of chapter 19